I am unashamed. What about you? So I spoke at the Boys and Girls Club from the state of Louisiana, that big meeting in West Monroe. But what happened was Grant, who worked for Buck Commander, he's like, hey, can you speak at the Boys and Girls Club? I was like, sure. I was thinking 15, 20, <laughs> you know, boys and girls. Because it was no big deal, you know. And then the day of, he's like, remember you got the Boys and Girls Club at the convention center, which should have sparked something. Yeah. Why would you go to a convention yeah. center? I get there and look in there, and it is pack suits and ties i mean you can't stick another person in here so i get up there and the guy's fixed to introduce me i leaned over and i said what exactly do you want me to say because <laughs> i had no contact and he's like oh you haven't been briefed i was like i have no idea other than we're here something about the boys and girls club and uh but you know what it turned out great because i just got up there i'm like we're in louisiana which i love we're helping boys and girls who have had a difficult time. And mm -hmm. the audience was all the volunteers and coaches and mentors. And I kind of told about my childhood. I was like, Hey, there was a couple year period in my life, you know, where I, I was the boys club. Yeah. You know, I was looking for a mentor, <laughs> we, but we were, look, we had our own club out here. So I shared Jesus, even though this was not a church thing. And I said, look, whether you're a believer or not, these principles and i quoted first corinthians 13 you know and kind of went in the deal about when you take god out of our schools and, and our homes you take those principles out there's the problem with our kids we need to put those principles in look the whole room stood up and gave a standing ovation when i did that hmm. and it was not a faith you know, base thing. I was going to say, are they you know, very wise by doing what you did? Because they're was not encouraged. really encouraged. They're not really a faith group. More no. just a kind and of I, a, look, I'm all for them. That's why I was yeah, there for free. Right. I was like, I'll come, you know, we're yeah. helping kids. I'm in, yep. you know, yep. and they knew yep. I had coached some with difficult kids. Right. And I told a few coaching stories, you know, where it's not the kids, it's the parents, you know, but it really went well. That's awesome. And, uh, I, I was excited about it. I was in, uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, this past weekend. Did you go to Walmart? Uh, I <laughs> did not go to Walmart, but boy, I saw a lot of Walmarts. And yeah. uh, but I, we were um, so we were speaking at Grace Point Church, which was a great church up there. I did like a Willie was there, which was funny. So I don't. What was he you know, doing there? Well, he was speaking at the same thing I was, and oh, I had, had no idea. Well, like I knew like two weeks prior, I got yeah. word. So we did a marriage thing. So he and Cor so Lisa and I went first. Of course, our marriage story is heavy. You know, it's yeah. we do it all the time. And then they came in behind us, which was really good because there's you know there's is funnier and Willie just you know Willie being Willie. So it was really a nice combo because I talk a lot about sort of mom and dad's marriage and what God has done to sort of bring us through this whole thing. And then Lisa and I as well. And Willie taught more posts like the show and our family and the impact. Mm -hmm. So it was really kind of cool the way it worked out. And then Willie and I spoke at a men's thing the next day. That was for a group called Men Sharpening Men. So I met this guy who uh, he came up to me. First of all, I was impressed because I'm in hog heaven. I mean, I'm in Bentonville, Arkansas, which is right up the road from Fayetteville, which is everybody there. Oh, is, literally hog heaven. It is hog heaven, Arkansas, yeah. everywhere. And this guy comes up, and I was like, well, there's my new best friend, LSU shirt, in, right in hog heaven. I said, I bet you're popular around here. He said, oh, I get ripped daily. How do you get ripped? <laughs> When's the last time Arkansas won well, over three games? Well, of course, you should have heard Willie just ripping Arkansas the entire season. Do they still have a football team? I mean, like, yeah. the whole thing. It was just short of getting booed and like, like side at the event. you got to commend their loyalty. <laughs> exactly. and Because they've had a rough stretch. So anyway, this guy comes up to me, Dad, and he's he's wearing those shoes. So automatically, I'm like, I, I like this guy. Turns out he's from DeRitter. And he said, I think you, you guys know my dad. And I said, well, who's your dad? And he said, Dean Burns. And I was like, Dean Burns, that name sounds familiar. And he said, he was a Walmart buyer in the 80s, right up to early 90s. <clears throat> and uh, I was like, well, he would have been our guy, you know, or one of them. I know they rotate a lot through there. And uh, But it turns out, I mean, I know that Walmart, you know, and, and I talked to him about this. Well, you know, we really appreciate him and others because – they really gave us our first shot. Oh, there's no doubt. To I, then I, become national players. I say in my speeches, they're like, when people see us and say, how did this happen? I'm like, well, obviously God Almighty had a plan. And then I say, and Walmart. 
because when we got those videos in Womp, they were just hunting videos. Just not, you know, everybody may not know our story, but when you got the duck calls in the Walmart, okay. But when you got the videos in there, you, you know, anything will sell in Walmart, including bearded. The way I got them in there was the kicker because I, I would drive by every year. I'd go once a year, a loop. Well, I'd go up into Arkansas, over in the Mississippi, and then I'd go over in Arkansas, over in te- East Texas, and come around through South Louisiana and come back to the house with about $5 in my pocket. And I'd pull up pull up at all these sporting goods stores. I'd just go through town, look in the phone book. Is there a sporting goods store? But stop somebody. Is there a sporting goods store in this town? They'd tell me. <clears throat> I'd go down there and try to sell them, you know, you know a dozen duck calls. Well, I noticed when I kept on about the third or fourth year on my loop, I noticed that that sporting goods store would dry up and I would see these Walmart mm-hmm. things right outside of town. In the, and, and I said, hmm. And everybody said, yeah, they got a sporting goods store in there, you know. So I said, well, good night. <clears throat> it looks like they're running these but smaller, you- smaller things out of business. I said, I need to go in there and see if I can sell these people. Well, I started driving around to the Walmarts and getting my tail ran out or run out of there. Yeah, they hurt. won't let you do that. <laughs> well, I think I'd you... go in and say, hey, let's get some duck calls in this thing. Pretty good duck hunting up in here. But you and eventually said, got a letter that well, allowed no, you to do that. Well, it wasn't a letter. Right? I, was, I was just going around. Well, finally, after multiple being run out of the stores, finally <laughs> some guy said, he said, I'll tell you what. He said, you, you got an order form here? And I said, no. I said, <laughs> I said, you got one? He said, well, we got an order form back there. And I, I said, look, just pay me out of petty cash back there or something. I said, send me my money after you sell the duck call. Welcome so to corporate he, America. You know, he looking at me. He said, he said I'll, I'll try six of them. I said, okay. Well, once I got that six in a Walmart, I drove to the next one. I said, listen, these things are hot. And Walmart's <laughs> stocking these duck calls in the stores. Well, I would show them his order form. And the, 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 the first one that saw it said, just give me what what he, he got i said hey never get somewhere i go the next one well, my, my sheet got thicker as i went so it looked like you were just knocking it yeah. out of the park because you got oh, yeah. all these I, orders I said, Boy, so the second year <laughs> i had me a little deal going there well i got it up to about twenty five thousand dollars in sales after about the first two or three years which was huge well, back i was in feeling good day. about it well one day the phone rang and some guy said uh you mr robertson i said i said yes sir and he said mr robertson i'm trying to figure out how you're getting your duck calls into the Walmart chain. <laughs> I said, one store at a time, and I will pick up Chuck of mine. He said, you, you just settle them off the street? I said, basically, that's what's going on. And I said, I'm feeling pretty good about it. I said, who are you, by the way? He said, I'm the buyer, the one you're supposed to be talking to to get your product in Walmart. It was probably said, Dean oh. Burns. I said, oh, I didn't know I was kind of circumventing you there. I said, but you know, I feel pretty good. What do y'all think? And he said, you're actually doing pretty good. I said, hey, I appreciate that. He said, I tell you what, you come up here and talk to me, and we can see if we can get this thing done right. Well, he's the one. That's about year five. He stocked that Duck Men Five or whatever it was. He stocked one of our DVDs. Yeah, and yeah. all the Walmart <laughs> well, stores. I think it was a video. And so we looked down and said, "Good night." I mean, you know, we're up in six figures here, but but that's the way it works. Well, we didn't I, realize the video. Not only were we getting paid for it. It was advertising our duck calls. It was like the ultimate marketing system. Your people are actually buying an, an advertisement because all we did was duck hunt, and then they would say, "Well, let me try one of the duck calls." You yeah. know? Walmart let us slide, and the way we were doing it, which we was not not the way you're supposed to do it. <laughs> but my line to the people at Walmart, the sporting goods uh, department head. I would go back there, and then and they said, oh, yeah, we don't, we don't. I said, well, you think we're going to buy them off the street? I said, I said, guys, I said, Colonel Sanders, at some point, fried a chicken. <laughs> and his buddy or somebody came over and said, Colonel, that's pretty good chicken. I said, he had to start somewhere. He fried yeah. a chicken, and somebody liked the way he fried chicken. I that's said, right. I'm just saying, unless I get a few in here, how am I ever going to sell them? And I it said, proves the, the point that truly anything can sell in Walmart. Somebody came along as a finger licking, finger licking, finger licking good. Finger licking good. There you go. It's so that was the, the one I history. used, my line, one of the lines I used. Ah, you know, give me six of them. You know, I have to tell them that line, you know. All right, you people of America out there. 
It doesn't take but one natural disaster, hurricane, tornadoes, whatever, or some foreign power take the grid down and you're stuck for days or weeks and you were not prepared. I live way down here in the middle of the woods. I can just keep rolling no matter what happens. We'll survive. Emergency strike. Are you prepared for days? Electricity. Grub. I'm not paranoid. I'm just prepared. Be prepared. My Patriot Supply. Uh, I'll be eating homestyle potato soup. By the way, if trouble comes your way and it's a nightmarish event, disaster that comes upon you, make sure that if you come down here and you want me to help you survive, make sure you bring in your truck. You bring uh, home-style potato soup, Patriot Pantry, buttermilk pancake mix. Listen, what we have here, orange energy drink mix. These people, this stuff will keep for 25 years, for years. You take this and you load a pickup truck load of it and you come my way if things get too tough. You can save $100 on a four-week emergency food supply. Go to, the, go to this special website, Prepare with Phil. It's not paranoia. It's just preparedness. Preparewithphil.com. It's a mean world. Man-made disasters are natural disasters. They're both rough. Be prepared for it. Four-week food kits include breakfast, lunches, dinners, 25 years. They ship it free, discreetly to your door. The writing's already on the wall. Things happen. Be prepared because your life can change in a moment. Don't forget this. Preparewithfield.com. Be ready for whatever happens. Don't forget that. But anyway, I will give Walmart this. They made us, they, Walmart, made us a national product. Yeah. Say what you will about Walmart. Without them, Duck Commander would have, wouldn't, wouldn't well, be here. And it's really interesting because from that humble start, when the show hit, and then, of course, they were selling a gazillion dollars worth of Dynasty merchandise, which is a whole other story. But Dad was invited. I remember going with you, Dad. You you were featured and spoke briefly at all the Sam's. You know, it was in Bentonville. That is all correct. All the executives of Sam's, they were yep. all there for a big rally on Saturday morning. You spoke. They asked me to come. And then Willie and Corey, <laughs> and maybe you, Jay, spoke at a Walmart version of the same thing in Bentonville because they oh, have these rallies they do. That's where I did the worst thing ever. I spoke, and uh, and I think Phil and Casey were there. You know, nobody important will be there, so don't, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, I remember it went wrong. So I speak, and this guy comes up, and he says, what do you think about the new Walmart buyer? And I said, well, I heard because I had. He's just a slasher. I mean, this guy probably wouldn't know a, you know, a duck from a billy goat. That's what I said. Well, when I said that, he removed his tie from his tag, and it was, and the, it was, na- it was the new buyer. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> oh, I just made a terrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I just looked horrified. But it's pretty it. slick on his part. What do you think about the well, Walmart? I thought he, it was a little shady, actually. You know, I well, mean, he put me out there, and then I ripped on, him. But later on, didn't y'all come to a meeting of the minds when we Bennett's did. got the cooking? And you know, we did. I actually, when he he called me up there, and he's like, "Hey, I'm the guy you ripped to his face," you know. <laughs> so I go up there, and he kind of used that, and he's like, "I'm not paying over this price," and I was like, "Well, I don't guess you'll be." having our product and i actually got out of that meeting you know without a deal and it was i remember funny i remember that well at first when i called you because y'all would always you know be waiting at the phone and say how did it go and i was like oh fantastic couldn't be better <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah hung up the phone and missy's like that was a lie <laughs> i was thinking i just couldn't do it i couldn't tell you that well yeah. we're not at walmart but actually 
you know, we didn't have any kind of words. And then three months later, the order came in for right. the price I had said. It was like it never happened. Jay yeah. said the buyer would tell him. He said, you know, y'all talking about these videos. He said, these videos, they don't sell. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that buyer told him later, he said, I watched every one of them and loved them. <laughs> yeah. But, but he didn't tell Jay. He, said, yeah, he, said, he that, would always say, yeah. oh, these DVDs, they're no big deal. Huh? Well, I met one of the buyers who had, he quit Walmart, and just years later I saw him in a restaurant. That's when he said that. He said, hey, I have to tell you something. I don't work for Walmart anymore. He said, I was just putting on. He said, I love your videos. So so he said, they train, us, they train us to get yeah. that low ball, low oh, ball yeah. them no matter what. It's so funny how people are in character. I, I spoke at, uh, at uh, Paris Island where the Marine – recruits all go mm-hmm. and you've seen it before we've seen it on movies and stuff they got that section the bus pulls up and they got these the yellow painted where their feet go and everybody those recruits have to go you put your heels on those yellow feet and yeah. then some guy comes out you know looking right under the brim of that hat the discipline procedure he, has begun he starts by just chewing their butt yeah. you know for the first whatever until they break and come in so they wanted me to have the experience so it's just me out there they put me on the feet, you know. This young guy comes out. He's about 25 years old. And, I mean, just chisel, you know. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, just he's got to look <laughs> like he could just chew a nail. <laughs> he steps up and just starts. And I know it's like, you know, not I'm not real. real. It's not real. All but, the parenting you never received <laughs> oh is fixing goodness. to go. <laughs> I mean, my insides turned to jelly. You know, this guy is just reaming me out. And then I would say, I try to respond, yes, sir. Don't you call me, sir. I'm not a sir. I work for it. You know, he's just, so he's owned me this whole time. And so finally, like, he, bur- you know, it stops. And I, cause I was kind of relieved. You know, I was like, yeah. And then he leans in and says, man, my family loves your show. You guys are so awesome. <laughs> and then it was like, then he was a 25-year-old kid that would yep. just love the show. But I, I just, I, I've never forgotten that, you know, when you can go into character, whatever the character is, you can sell it. I there mean, is something I was about scared. Al breaking them. Uh, you have to break them, and That's then you it, have to make them. I asked the guy, I said, well, so how often, I mean, what's your typically, how long does it take to break it? Because most of these are 18, 19-year-old kids. How long does it take to break them down? He said, totally depends on the person. He said, some people don't, they break down right where you're standing. They never make it in the building before they break. Oh, yeah. He said, and others, they'll go right up to the whole 10 weeks. I said, well, what happens if you don't break them? He said, then they're not, they don't become Marines. So the bottom line well, is, yeah, I mean, you have, have to, to be broken you, you down. To, right. Yeah. If, if you don't. Can you imagine, Cy, if you hadn't gone through that process? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we needed that. I yeah. think maybe. Yeah. How did he even make it through the process? As know. stubborn as he so is. So the question no, would be, is. why is it that if you want a well-oiled, highly trained machine like the Marine Corps, why is it that you start yeah. and you finish with discipline? That's right. We've lost that in America and our family structure, and look at us now. Well, and I was so impressed. I was there to speak for the Navy chaplains who try to minister to these kids spiritually, and I had no idea. Most of the kids that were going in that I'm looking at in the Marine Corps, and they look, by the way, they look like they were 12 instead yeah. of 18, but most of them come out of terrible situations. It's either jail or the Marine Corps. A lot of them are homeless. And so when they get there, the pressure on them is there's nowhere to go. By the you, way, you either make it or or you have nothing. By the way, I thought of something yesterday. It just occurred to me. I want a study done. Some of you people out there in the computer land, Uh-oh. you've got oh, plenty boy. of sense. I want a, an in-depth study done. And here's what I want you to find out. And you can send the information to us here on Unashamed. I want to read what you came up with. I want to know. Out of all the shooters, the mass shooters, and the murders, and then whether it be knives, guns, whatever, baseball bats, the ones I want to know, but especially the shooters, how many individuals, once they're studied, why did they do it? We don't have a motive. We're looking for it. How many Christian, God-fearing hunters have been found guilty of committing these crimes against their neighbors. Mm-hmm. I want them to research them. They say, well, it's mental illness. It's that and the other. He had trouble child. I want to know how Which many true, so. God fearing, Jesus loving spirit filled individuals who have guns and they are hunters. They hunt birds or deer or both. 
How many of those have been found? Is that their, is that their MO? The ones that are Christians. What I'm saying is, add them all up. How many of them were God-fearing, Jesus-loving individuals? I want to know that. And I'm here to say that I believe you're going to find not one of them was a Christian, God-loving, Jesus-fearing hunter. I don't think you're going to find a one of them, if he was that way, that did that, which would give us an idea on how to solve the problem. Yep. If you can't find any Christian young boys that are shooting up the place, right. why? Why Why is it? Well, would, it's, but I do think you got mental illness, you got other factors, you know. I mean, it. it but it is a problem. I mean, like I said, even the school system itself. Are the Christians take, doing the when, killing is what my question when is. When you take yeah. God out of the scenario. But well, in, you know, and to Dad's yeah. point, if money you, hasn't fixed it out. No, money and if you immediately go to the background checks have not fixed it, you say no. Nope, they if do you all immediately they just go to the weapon of choice. Obviously, you're not dealing with the problem, which is your point, which I think is a good one. So, send us information. Uh, we're looking for that. So let's get uh, let's get right into where we left off last week. Uh, we got a lot of comments from you guys this past week uh, about the discussion we had last week, which was kind of a continuation of our sort of patriarch discussion from the Book of Genesis. And uh, we, we talked about Jacob and Esau, who were the twin sons of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. So we're kind of just following the, the seed line that we talked about and the, sort of that bigger picture. Well, I had a lot of comments about, you know, they questions about asking about Romans 9, because Romans 9, 10, and 11 is pretty difficult to understand. And people ask. Especially if you pull it out of the context of the book of Romans. But Genesis, I mean, a Romans 9, where he said, uh, you know, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated, which people interpret to mean, you know, a lot of things. Right. But when you read that that was a direct quote from Genesis 25, and he was basically referencing the nations that would come from those two seed lines. I think Esau was the correct. Edomites. Or, right. And, uh and Jacob, obviously, Israel, which was his Jews. But the point for us, if you read Genesis 25 and you read what happened in like Malachi 1, which will be some research you can do on your own, you'll you'll come to the conclusion that was reached in, in Romans is that neither one of those really matter. It doesn't matter where you came from. You, as far what, as your human lineage is concerned. That's right. As far as your salvation. Your DNA. Right. Yeah. You know, because our whole theme, even for this podcast, you know, Romans one sixteen, that we're unashamed because of the gospel, which whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, which is pretty much from Israel or anywhere else, you come together in salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Correct. Which was his point. Which was his point, especially so, in Romans in Romans 9 through 11, which he was speaking to that Jewish audience, that first right. century Jewish audience. To prove your point, Jace, we didn't go into this much last time, but I did mention that you remember God made a prediction. He, he told the, the mom, Rebecca, here's what he told her. The Lord said to her, this is Genesis 25, 23, two nations... Right. Or in your womb, so in other words, he he told her he gave her the big play right there, big time planning behind all exactly. this. That's why we said the scheme of redemption. A lot of people were ask they were asking about that. Right, we're not we're not getting it. But you know, it's hard for you just to take something out. Right, you know, we're telling these stories like they're stories, but they're actually way bigger than that. Yeah, exactly. it, it, God was looking at it from nations and for thousands of years right. down you the get road. That high view. Yeah, to to at one time in in our history to bring all nations the under hall, under Jesus. The hall of faith is being you, you're reading about the hall of faith because just Joseph, which we're talking about today, uh, Genesis thirty nine, about verse five. The Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. Mm -hmm. You read a few verses over by the time you get to verse 21. While Joseph was there in prison, all these ups and downs of a young man's life, the Lord was with him. 
He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden, even when he was in there. Verse 23, the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care. They're cutting him some slack, and someone says, why are they doing that? Because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success, listen, in whatever he did. He was a man of faith, but if you don't look at those verses, by the time you get to the Apostle Paul describing what happened to the Jews as a nation right. and their rejection of Jesus, you say it begins to form a pattern. In the last few words of Genesis, you get to the very end, the last chapter in Genesis uh, 50. 50, you get in it uh, 24, Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. You say, end of the line for Joseph. We read about his life, but God was with him because of his faith. Here comes this fine woman, the king's wife, going to take, you know have sex with him. Joseph, <laughs> Joseph stood his ground. So we got somebody, shocker of shocks in this case, it wasn't a man. It's always in our culture these days, the man's always the culprit. But in this case, well, what do you know? We have a woman, amazing, trying to seduce a man. You're like, what in the world? Uh, it does happen, ladies and gentlemen. But it um, is quite a story. I mean, you got 13 chapters, basically, with one story, with Joseph's almost, life. God will surely come to your aid, is what it says in Genesis 50, 24. We're back on Joseph and his faith. <laughs> to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now we're putting them all together, the men of faith through whom the seed line Jesus came and the timeline. Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. I mean, so the, the writer in Hebrews brings that up when he's talking about the hall of faith, Al. That's all he said about Joseph was that he wanted to By you know, faith, see Joseph, the promised land yeah. it with when, his bones. When his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instruction about his bones. You say, right. well, what do you know? He was one of those men of faith right. going all the way back, go behind him, and you get to Shem, and you get to Noah, and you going right. on back to Adam and Seth. But Each one of those, that lineage, he follows that lineage, and it's all they all end up in the hall of faith way down right. through history. But Pretty those, amazing. But set up the story. Well, I was going to say, so Dad gave yeah. us the end. Let me back the rig yeah. up yep. and, and start at the beginning. So you have these the two, the two sons. You have Jacob and Esau, and we understand now those are nations as well as just men, which really helps that discussion Jace brought up. So Jacob now, fast forward, and we talked about last week how he had a life change experience in Genesis 32, and ironically, it was when he was about to reconnect with Esau, uh, which, by the way, that the, the prophecy was that the older would serve the younger, meaning Esau to Jacob, but that never happened in their life. Yeah. That only happened as the nations, Edom to Israel, which is interesting to prove your point again. Boy, and you reckon God could see into the future? Oh, my goodness. Ooh. It's always that bigger view. you got to remember that when you're looking at the but scripture. But we can't see that as humans. No. Know? So that's why you read these stories and you're fascinated, which, right. which the details of all this makes you really realize how could someone have made this all up? Just can't do it. it, it it's there. The one who wrote this, Moses, how in the world would he have known all about <laughs> about oh, Jacob and yeah. Esau? Which, is, through which thousands we haven't even gotten years. Him. How could uh, he have known oh, that? Right. You're going of manuscripts over thousands of years and seeing references to nations in the big picture, and you're like, wait a minute, how did this guy <laughs> know, know about that? It, it's just all right. So here's the deal. So so Jacob has twelve sons by basically four different wives. And um, so Judah is long in there. I'm not sure I'd have to look, but he's around, you know, son number four. I mean, we'll you know, take your word for it. All right. So he, that was a bunch of them. So the lineage that we talk about, this seed line, it's going to go through Judah, you know, which we'll talk about more later. But just remember, so he's the the one of the 12 sons where the, the lineage goes through. Joseph doesn't come along until right at the end. The last wife of the first one of the first wives, but the last one to have children was Rachel, and she had two sons, and one of them was Joseph. And back then they lived longer, and you had you know right different. So he's at the end of the line. He's really for a long time he was the youngest son, but then until his brother came along. So he we we start reading about him 
uh, in, in Genesis 37. And so we find out that he was favored by Jacob because Jacob loved Rachel more than the other wives, which is a whole another thing we're not getting into, but this blended family is a lot of trouble. So the last wife, he loves her the most, the last one to have children. So he loves Joseph, but Joseph has a unique talent. Yeah, dreams. He's able to interpret other people's dreams, including his own, which makes him not a fan favorite. He's about 17 well, years old. Well, his problem was he had a dream about his brothers, like pretty much like I did when I was a kid. <laughs> and when you divulge that information, because basically you, you always come out on top. You know, no matter what happened, because it's your dream. And Joseph shared that. Right. Well, Listen, my all, dream. Because everybody you know, was bowing down to him all, in the dream. Yeah, he's like, I had a dream, and y'all were all bowing down, which is basically, you think about when you're a kid, that's your goal. You want all your brothers to bow down. That's you want right. to be top of the mountain, that's which right. usually winds up in you rolling but to around make this on story, the ground, to, in the ground. To make this story worse, imagine if Jeff had told us about this dream to Willie, you, and me. We'd have said, hey, little short peaky finger, you're, yeah. we're not. We're never going to bow down. Well, he to you. basically did try that. Well, I know you boys are my ways. sons, but if you could see, if I had time to sit down and talk to you about it, if you saw my dreams, I, it, it is a a mighty throng of individuals in pursuit of me to take my life. I mean, there's everybody's they're, trying to kill they're, you. They're, everybody's trying to kill me. They're in coming your dreams? from. In my dreams, they're you coming. Had a psychiatrist come that on. Means, I mean, must I'm mean getting something. down in my dreams, and when I really go to jumping in, in, in the bed, in this case, hey, 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 calm down here, because she said you're having another dream. I mean, I because I said, you know what just happened in my dream, and she says, what? We're we're talking about this at two o'clock in the morning. I said I was hanging by one just one hand on a cliff, and below me was five thousand feet of rocks. <laughs> And I said, this dude has started stomped one hand, so I haven't the one hand left. What was left. this over? Huh? You what don't, was it he all He was just over? trying to kill you? I don't know what it's over. they just after me. And I you just, just find, come in there in the I battle. I find myself with individuals worldwide or after <laughs> me, and look, I'm hanging by one hand, and he is stomping on that hand when I wake up. And I'm like, but here's the good news. Somehow I always am able to to barely escape like the flames are leaping at me and I'm just barely making it. What they mean, I have no idea. So look, Jase, you'll appreciate this. First time I heard this, we were traveling with mom and dad. So we get to the airport. It's five, you know, five in the morning. It's the early flight. And mom's like, oh, my finger is hurting so bad this morning. I said, well, what, what happened? And she said, at two o'clock in the morning, you're, I woke up just screaming because your dad was twisting my finger. And I was like, and I looked at that, and, and so he tells the story of the guy who's looming over him trying to do it, and Dad is peeling up what he thinks is the toe yeah. <laughs> of his attacker. Yeah. But yeah. in reality, that was one of them stomping deals <laughs> at the end, and I and I and I heard somebody holler, and I said, "I've got him now." And I looked around; it is my wife, Miss K. <laughs> so, Mom, this is really disturbing. Oh, it's very oh, so. Know, right? But look, I get so tickled. <laughs> At the air, I mean, I get so tickled in the retelling of it because then dad starts telling the dream that we're laughing so hard in the airport. Everybody there, you know, small airport is looking at us and we're just, I mean, belly laughing and how big this is. But then I realized this has been going on for a while. So I don't know. Years. There's a lot of things in the Bible where there was communication that happened in dreams, you know, and if you were able to really, you know, divulge that, I mean, that, which, which he did the whole, his whole story was revolved around these dreams and interpretation, which God was giving to them in I'm not going to get a shrink's advice. I'm just going to live with the fact that I'm being pursued. <laughs> well, you kind of are. You kind of have been a marked man culturally. I mean, people yep. are, do get well, after and you. Had a maybe pretty, that's uh, part of it. I maybe don't know. So. Well, you had a pretty volatile past, so there may yep. be, you know. But I think my th- I have a theory about that, Jason. God always barely pulls me through it, so I'm thinking. I mean, so. I have had some, some thoughts about people, and I woke up, and then I checked on them, and there was some issue, and I thought, yeah, was that God doing that? Well, here's here's mine. I've woke up. I've like gone to bed troubled and praying about a situation. Somebody, usually it's a person that's going through something. And so I'm praying about their situation. And I've woke up before at four in the morning with just a picture of somebody in mind. And then later on that day, I think, you know, I think 
that may have been a message because that person right. I think could help this person. So my here's my theory. It may be wrong. It's just theory. It's not biblical. But since there's a lot of dream related stuff in the Bible, because you know, by the way, we didn't go into Jacob had a whole dream where he saw heaven and all this mm-hmm. stuff. So that may have been a genetic Stairway thing. Stairway to heaven. Stairway to heaven. Led Zeppelin got it from Genesis. Yep. So I think when you sleep, your subconscious, you know, that you're that's probably maybe when we're the closest to whatever I you think know, the so. other realm. Yeah, in other so. words, so your your mind is you're you're in deep sleep, but your subconscious has a kind of an awareness there because dreams are let's face it, they're weird. You know, I go well, for months and everything is tranquil and and uh, all kinds of good dreams. But there are times if I do have one, it's the same same mo. Here's what I'm what being I pursued. When you're, when, I'm being pursued, and there's way. It's just you're not going to. It's, but in, it's so many you're not going to live past. In this. the waking yeah. hour, your brain functioning is going to block things that would try to get into that thought process. Mm-hmm. When you're asleep, that sort of self defense is out. That's so right. then it's whatever's happening tries That's to right. go straight in. Oh, so here's what I don't like. I don't like it when my wife gets mad at me. Because I didn't execute, you know, to her expectations in, you know, some kind of weird scenario or whatever. I mean, the one of the biggest fights we ever had is uh, she was like, I had this weird dream. Some people broke in the house and you weren't here. I'm like, it was a dream. She's like, yeah, they were ransacking the place. I'm, I'm horrified. I mean, where were you at? I'm like. <laughs> It was a dream. I have enough mistakes already. Are you actually mad that I was gone, like playing cards or whatever? But she was like, well, I'm just saying. I mean, you pretty, need to be around. Yeah, I mean, you don't realize I was really scared. I was like, it was a dream. I <laughs> usually, I usually end up and and when someone says, "Can you figure it all out?" I said, "No," but I I usually end up with, "Blessed are you." When, when you are hated, when mm-hmm. people hate you, when you are excluded, insulted, right. or your name is rejected because of me, Jesus said. Right. The great is your reward in heaven. So I always go back to, look, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed no matter, and, and somehow I always in my dreams, I barely pull through every time. And I'm so like, well, I do believe Thank you, Lord, too, for what, getting me out of that one. I right. do believe what you put in helps with that. You know, it's just like what you put in your head it does affect yeah. you know what you dream of so which is another it could be a side for, issue from spiritual warfare because we're be, in it boys well, yeah. let's face it but i mean i'm saying even in the christian music world and you know bible yeah. studies and having good conversation i mean if you're looking at filth all the time you know on tv or you know around yep. that's probably going to be a well part of yeah your, then, your then you're having these dreams yep. i do think in that that view because the holy spirit doesn't stop working because you're sleeping but you know if you suppress it while you're awake right well, what do you think you're going to dream about? So, yeah. so here's the yep. deal with Joseph. He, his dreams, and, and at the time they were not well accepted, but they did turn out to be true. That's the difference with him. Is, his brothers was really dogging him about right. it, right? And and, and, he, and he was going <clears throat> forward about thirty years in the future. God was giving him a glimpse of what really was going to happen. Yep. What's interesting is the brothers' reaction plays into the narrative that had to happen to get Joseph well, right. to where he which went. Which is the whole Which thing. is the whole point. But but you got to, you know, what what happened was they couldn't deep down in their heart kill him even though they hated him. So he winds up. They called up, him the dreamer. Yeah, he, he ends up being sold into slavery, and but God was with him. And so he worked with him even, you know, in a situation where he was sold as a slave, he became... You know, he worked his way up the ladder. Some of his positions he ended up in, you wouldn't think he could have escaped it. Well, how he got there, which showed him God. By the way, the oldest brother, let me just speak up for oldest brothers. Now, they were all in on it, but the oldest brother, Reuben, he did have enough wherewithal to because they were going to kill him. Kill him and, he, and so he, he had. trying to talk him out. He was trying to talk him out. <laughs> so, so they threw him in a, in a cistern, in, uh, which is a well. And then Reuben was going to double back and get him out of the well. Unfortunately, you know, they sold him before he got back. Now, Jace, you've had a little sister. Yeah, look, when we bought this old place right across the river right here, it has three cisterns. And, of course, I went, I said, I got to get in the bottom. Old, old cisterns. Oh, yeah. I mean, 150 <coughs> years old. But I got in the bottom one that was dry because I was looking for treasure. And, mm-hmm. uh, but boy, when I got down in there, I thought about this story because I was down there five minutes and I thought, you're talking about rough. It's dark. Claustrophobic. You can't breathe. 
yeah it, it yeah claustrophobic i mean what a what a terrible you're way up under the ground the air quality is terrible i mean what a terrible experience mm-hmm. and so what they did was they sold them into slavery but what was even worse to cover themselves they told a story they Joseph, jacob had given joseph a coat you know the, the coat of many colors we said an ornamental robe type thing so they took that they put some goat's blood on it took it back to jacob and basically broke their father's heart which to me is one of the worst parts of the story because i mean they right. knew how much he you loved lie. it. they yeah. lied to cover that they sold him in slavery they felt good they didn't kill him but then they broke his heart i mean you know and, and look he was devastated you know, because this was his favorite son. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. So so that's the way it kind of gets led. So Joseph goes into Egypt, which is all part of God's plan. Again, that big picture, because he's got something big he's going to do in Egypt down the road. So he gets Joseph there. The first thing that happens, Joseph gets sold into one of the Pharaoh officials' house. So he's kind of in a, one of the higher-ups. He's he's the guy. But he quickly, as, as you pointed out earlier, to show from the scriptures, God was with him, so he had success. He's a young man. That's right. But he's the kind of guy you can put in charge of stuff, and it gets done, and it gets done well. Well, until Pharaoh's wife enters the scene. Until Mrs. P. So I want to talk about her because Mrs. Potiphar comes along. And to me, it's evident when you read the text in Genesis 38, 39, or 37, 39, you see that she's the kind of woman that obviously is used to having her way with the help. Well, I think it was more of... You know, Pharaoh said you can. He told Joseph, "You can have anything you want." There's some line in there somewhere, except with my wife. Right. And so, the one thing that she couldn't have was what she wanted. That's right. I think that's, and it was kind of, I think, a power trip. You know, you you work for us, and it says he was handsome and well built. You know, but but from my experience, most women, it's not really about what men look like you know men are more visually stimulated i mean no, I, I know there's a few exceptions but i think men get that wrong about women it's usually more it's something else besides right. that is what i mean because i mean you you'll see you know a lot of beautiful women married to men that you're like you know it's well it's well, it, what's going on here it, it puts it in a physical context you're right it says that he was well built and handsome so the bible does let you know he was a looker and it was it was you want something it was forbidden. Right. it was forbidden it, it was fruit. forbidden for both of them you know that's out so the wife and, said, and what hey, he, i'll do whatever what I he want told to her do. he said my master has given me everything to be in charge of everything in his house except for you his wife uh-huh. so he's letting her know your persona non grata so he's running from her but the bible then says day after day she pursued it she's kept on trying you know she wouldn't stop which to me is kind of that bigger picture of how this sort of especially test, a test of one's faith exactly and especially sexual <clears throat> immorality type sins how it's just insidious i mean it just continues to someone who's this like in this situation i've used this story many times in trying to help people you know like who are saying oh well i'm private messaging this this woman who, you know this guy's married you know and it's like just on social media, but it's no big deal. And I'm like, where's this headed? Where are we? Go- it's always going to go somewhere. You know, does your wife know about it? Well, no. It's like, but, but we're just, we're, we're just messaging. But I always use the story example. It's not going to, what, where, what is the end game to this? You're just going to have these conversations and it's never going to get to real life. I got a letter no. the other day and a guy said, I know this is sinful. Mr. Phil, but <clears throat> but my problem is I'm having sex with my girlfriend. I know it's wrong. I'm just in a fix, and and I can't fix it. Can you help? <laughs> and I I said Dan, I said Dan, come in here and sit down with that black box of yours. I said send him this message. Uh, just stop having sex with her. <laughs> Start right there. Have a change of mind yeah. or marry her, and then you can have all you want. But that's your options. Think about this, and that's that's the message I sent him. Very but clear. he was saying, unlike Joseph, well, if 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 if, if I'm doing this, what can I do? Uh-huh. I, I I'm in a fix here, and I can't get out of it, and it's right there hiding in plain sight in right. front of him. Why don't you just stop doing it? Repent? Well, I think ultimately <clears throat> it's the motivation. I mean, I thought about you know the big controversy that you supposedly started by quoting a verse back in our 
GQ. We talked about Doug this Dynasty. a couple of weeks ago, right, right. But you know what, what wasn't said in that interview, because I was there too, the first question the guy asked me, first he said, well, how much money do you make on these events, you know? And I was looking around thinking, what's that got to do with anything? And then he said, I mean, do you actually – expect people to believe that you waited until you got married before you had sex and he kind of laughed and i thought like wink wink this is me what yeah yeah so evidently i realized oh he must have like googled some of my speeches because i talk about that and but to him the idea of someone actually waiting till they're married was like impossible they're like are are you honestly telling people to do that if and you, you think expect they're gonna believe it to believe that you did it <laughs> and so you know i think my response was i will not answer any more questions from you unless i have a lawyer here because <laughs> i i sense that this is this is just a trunk <laughs> and that's before interview. we even got to me oh yeah well <laughs> phil when he got to you i thought well, it was over I think I actually told everyone, well, there's fixed to be some controversy here because it was just all in those kind of questions, you know. But I will say this, and and to say when someone asks that, we can't fix that stuff. It's all about motivation. I mean, and that's why we share Jesus with people. I mean, that was the motivating factor with me. So I set up, it was actually easier to do that than people think because you don't know what you're missing, number one. And number two, I set up a system where I was immediately telling girls that I would date, here's who I am, here's what I want to do. What do you think? Can you can you help with this? And I and I don't know what I'm missing. To me, it's way more difficult to do what's described in is it first Corinthians six, where it says, you know, it goes through the verse that you actually quoted, you know, the homosexual offenders or sexually immoral prostitutes, but it gets down to that key phrase, what is what what was your point that night which is and that is what some of you were but you were washed you were sanctified you were justified in the name of uh, of jesus well to me it's way more difficult to have that kind of lifestyle then come to jesus he forgives you he saves you and then you now got to go lead a changed life granted you have the spirit yep running the show but now you know what you're missing I didn't. America well, you know. is sort of, uh, not sort of, America is very hesitant about entertaining even the thought of living a life of restraint. Yeah. They're like, if you you mention you have to live a restraint Well, they're life. like, if it's you're none of your business. Jesus, We're not hurting anybody. And, Nobody's going to tell me who I have sex but with. But it they. comes down to a standard, which is true in our society. I mean, a lot of people, I think they're shocked at the way we view that. I'm like, whatever you're doing, you know, behind closed doors, I really don't care. Now, when you come to Christ and you look at his standards and how he changes your life, well, that's a different thing, you know. You're, you're wanting to trust him. And, and believe that God's way is the best way. But for this story, I mean, he didn't even do anything wrong. What's well, the exact yeah. wordage when, when the when the finally the so here's a, the here king's it is, wife, what was it where, where his coat was in her hand? But listen to this. So so for there's a lot of guys watching and listening to us right now. So the principle is right there in that one verse. And I want you to think about this. When you think about sex. What verse is that? This is Genesis 39.9. Yeah. We mentioned the first part. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. First thing Joseph does is he recognizes that his this woman belongs to someone else. And I always, when I talk about pornography, which is very rampant, obviously on the Internet, I always tell men, you, when you're looking at these naked women and you know having these thoughts you're having, that's someone's either wife or daughter or girlfriend or a potential sister in Christ. I mean, if you just objectify it where it's some means for you to get sexual gratification, you don't realize that's a human being that God created. That's the first thing he does. He he yeah. turns this woman into someone's wife. See, in his mind, he's like, this. I don't need to do this. And then the second part's the most important Which part. Which kind of goes in with what we said about the dreams. You exactly. know, if you watch porn for you know four hours a day, what do you think you're going to dream about? And, what do you and, think hey, you'll be doing? And look, it's, it gets, it's not a bunch of guys chasing you off a cliff. That's no, for sure. That's, <laughs> it, gets, it gets worse. And then he says, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Yep. And there's the crux. Yep. My relationship with God says, no, I'm not going to do this. So what happens is, to quote you, Dad, is – 
she took that instead of saying, okay, I need to back off on this guy. She went at him full board. He literally left his, and when he left, she's holding on to his jacket, trying to hold him back. And she winds up with a jacket in her hand. He's out the door and gone. Yep. But then she had evidence, which eventually leads him to going to prison. Right. Where he flourished because God was with him. Well, right. And then he interpret, starts interpreting these dreams, and it comes back full circle while he's in charge again because he's the only one that could interpret the That's dreams. That's right. Which leads to his brothers who sold him into slavery during the time of the famine, which was the dream he interpreted. Exactly. And and But it started because he did the right thing. That's and right. So I well, think he that's did the right Rose. thing at every turn. Right. I mean, within reason. I'm sure he made mistakes and all. He did. But, but the tenor of his life was trusting God. And right? Al, to add to your point, your, 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 you know, your, your exegesis here, which was fantastic, you get down at the bottom of uh, verse 12, your last option, I'm taking it, he left his cloak in her <laughs> hand, and the last option, Al, is to run. <laughs> hey, I've, run. Done, I've done it. <laughs> hey, the way Dad just you, run. You can always here's run. Here's the way Dad, remember Dad used to tell us these means, hit the road, boys, shaking that finger. Had, you yeah, got to run. I had a girl call me. i I didn't really date her, you know, but we were, I was interested. She was nice looking. And uh, she called me one night, said she had had a spiritual awakening and asked if I would come over and talk to her, you know. So yeah. this was all revolving around something spiritual. Well, I knock on the door and I, it looked dark inside, you know. And so she hollered, come in. Well, I, when I walked in, there's nobody else there. Well, she came down the, the steps and she's wearing nothing but a T-shirt and her underwear. Ooh. Mm-hmm. And I looked around for other people, and I thought, what do I do? And there was one word that popped into my head. Run. Jess. <laughs> this is too I never, easy. <laughs> I never have told you boys about this, but I always take a guy with me. But I could give you those same stories more than one. Sure. That did the, you know, we're going to have a Bible study. I get there, and the same thing happened. But yeah. we're, we're 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 leaving rubber, literally tire rubber, <laughs> as we're leaving. You well, say yeah. you are getting out of there, but man, I mean, you talking about? Yeah. Woo. You know what's weird? Is <laughs> they have managed are, to work rubber and, into to that this day. I know our audience will say, "Well, no way, you old coot." They, uh, you would think some old coot like me. The last thing you'd see is some woman coming up. But so many as you, oh, I'd like to talk to you. But you want to always get no good either. Look, I, I think when that's you. That's why I say take your woman with you and your Bible with you <laughs> yeah. wherever you go. I still do it. I still but do look, it. When you, when you go out loud on, in public and out loud that you're a one woman type of man, and, yep. we, and when you profess Jesus as Lord, I think that's enticing just like it was Pharaoh's No doubt about it. For people to say, well, no doubt. you wait till you get a hold of me. You ain't going to turn me yep. down. Because, look, I tell you, all those stories that I had in high school of girls that I turned down for that reason, yep. you would think they would be gone, but a lot of them, they just came a lot stronger. What That's stuns right. me is I'm, I'm, I tell Miss Kay, I said, you know, I'm old enough to be that girl. She's coming on like that and all this stuff. Of course, it, it fires Miss Kay up. She, she, boy, she gets <laughs> stirred up. But I said, you know what's amazing about it? I'm old enough to be their grandfather. I mean, yeah. it, it's like well, it was, it's an incredible story about Joseph. But I, I want to say when you get all to you the, guys what, out there that are that are are having problems with this, you read the story of Joseph, and it's a it's a good pattern to copy. It is. is he, he was a man of faith. I like the, how it ends in that he was somehow attaining to the resurrection. This yeah. is so far before Jesus's resurrection, but he wanted his bones to be carried. I thought about that. Uh, yeah. Lonesome Dove, you right. know, which is hilarious. And even when he has to take his body back to Texas, <laughs> yeah, he's like, I gave him a word. <laughs> he and he gets there and he said, Well, I guess that'll teach me. But it's, Give it, a man's word. It's amazing how these stories, you, you wonder if this is where they get it from the Bible because they were basically sure hauling where they jo- uh, uh, Joseph's body around to the promised land because he wanted yep. to be resurrected from there. It's an awesome story. So so next time we're going to come up, we're going to pick up from here. We can't. I can't wait for you guys to hear where this goes because this is really sort of the planting of the seed that's going to really lead to something really huge when we get to Exodus and beyond. What God does is incredible. So uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more next time. Uh, great exposition. We love hearing from you. By the way, thanks so much. You guys made us number one 
uh, podcast, and that's just because you're watching, you're listening, you're telling other people about it. We really appreciate it uh, for checking us out on Unashamed. And so, uh, by the way, we'll Al, continue there's a great the story. verse that's to cap this all off. Cap it. When, uh, yeah, when uh, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, flee from immorality. That's right. Flee, which means run. Leave your coat in their hand. That's a good one. We'll see you next time. So we're so glad you guys were with us today. You can subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or YouTube or Facebook. And be sure and rate us on iTunes so that other people can know about the podcast.